Sunday. Some of us are saying, Andy, what are we talking about? Pentecost Sunday is when we remember the coming of the Holy Spirit, the beginning of the New Testament church that we look back and we remember, as I shared on stage just a few minutes ago, that the Lord did not just want to walk on earth, God in the flesh. We believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life that he is God himself, but he sends the Holy Spirit to be even closer to us. And it says one of the things in Scripture in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit is actually a deposit. Somebody say a deposit. deposit. It's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance in heaven. That is amazing as the Holy Spirit is and how he counsels and comforts and convicts and makes us more like Christ and calls us into deeper waters and teaches us about who Jesus is and about what Jesus taught the disciples and what he wants us to walk into today. This is just a shadow, a glimpse of our full redemption and our sonship in heaven. Amen? So we remember on Easter the crucifixion, the resurrection. But then after that, we remember the ascension, that Jesus, he promises the Holy Spirit, that he stands, he sits at the right hand of the Father, blessing us, interceding for us. Think about that for a moment. We believe the Lord is Father, Son, Spirit. He is a triune God, three in one. And in Scripture, it says that Jesus even intercedes for you that the Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Another way to understand what intercession means is the Lord stands in the gap for you this morning. Whatever you're going through, the breakthrough that you need, isn't that good news that the Holy Spirit, that, that, that God the Son is literally interceding on our behalf right now, 24-7, 365? It says that the Holy Spirit even gives us words to pray. That when we don't even know what to pray, how many of y'all have ever been in a situation recently, you're so frustrated, tired, confused, and the good news is the Lord even gives us words to pray we don't even know what to ask for. These are some of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. We remember after the ascension that the Holy Spirit is poured out at Pentecost. And the setting for Pentecost, there's about 120 gathered in an upper room, and they're waiting, they're fasting, they're praying. They're like, Jesus, we've been following you for three years. Like, physically, you have been with us. We have ate with you. We have dined with you. We've seen you do miracles. We've seen you cast out demons. We've seen you heal the lame and the sick and the blind. And then you say you're leaving us so that your spirit can be with us? Like, like imagine the... the Potential confusion in, in our flesh, right, as humans. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? What's about to happen? And in Acts chapter 2, it says that suddenly, somebody say suddenly, suddenly, that all of the sudden, in the midst of their waiting, their fasting, their praying, suddenly the sound of like a violent wind filled the place with about 120, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they remembered that it said that John would baptize with water, but that they would be baptized with fire, the Holy Spirit. And they're not just walking, talking with Jesus, but now the Spirit is living and breathing and active and is poured out upon them, speaking in tongues. One of the things about Pentecost Sunday that we often brush past, though, is it wasn't just about spiritual gifts. It wasn't just about the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out. It was actually about an incredible unity that was brought. Because a lot of the Jews were saying, how is it that I thought the Messiah was just coming for us but you're telling me that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is now being poured out on the Gentiles too? That the Holy Spirit is actually a unifier. That he connects us across boundaries and barriers that culture would say, you can't do that. Jews don't associate with Gentiles. They don't hang out with each other. They don't like each other. And the Holy Spirit brought the two to become one. Are you with me this morning? This is how good the Holy Spirit is and what he does in and through our lives, that even when there's cultural barriers and, and the way that people vote differently, different skin colors, ethnicities, that the Holy Spirit brings two to become one of mind and one of heart. So this is what it says later on in Acts chapter 2. After the Holy Spirit is poured out, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 43, everyone was filled at awe with the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Many signs and miracles are happening. People who were lame for years were getting healed, Acts chapter 3, and they were dancing and praising. And the Sanhedrin, those who thought that they were holier than thou, were like, what is going on? This, this, 
movement of, of Jesus lovers and Jesus followers is breaking out and it's multiplying and it's scattering and people are getting saved, healed, baptized. But later on it says all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Verse 46, every day, somebody say every day. Every day. Every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread together in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number, imagine this, daily those who were being saved. Come on, the, the, the kingdom culture, the kingdom community that they were living in and, and bought into, it was so attractive, it was so real and powerful and moving that all of a sudden people were getting saved not once a week, not once a month, every single day being added into the body of Christ. I want to help you understand five different things that we can take away from this passage, the movement of the early church, the story of Pentecost, and how does that apply to our life? Five different things. Here's what they were doing. They were devoted to the word. Number two, they were committed to community. They gave generously. Number four, they walked in favor. And number five, they shared their faith. And here's what you need to note, unpack it in simple, a phrase for you to understand the early church and what was happening. This wasn't a weekly service. Pause here. This was a lifestyle. A lot of us have grown up in churches and around Hamilton County where going to church in many ways is something that we do to either check off the list or make us feel a little bit better about ourselves, <laughs> to maybe hope that God wants to do something in our lives, to, to maybe try to see if our kids might want to be interested in religion. But this wasn't a weekly service for them. This wasn't come and see and leave. This was a lifestyle. This was a culture. This was a way of living. They called the early Christians, they called it the way. This, this was the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is the way that they decided to build their entire life around. You see the difference? How countercultural this is? Let's go back to those five things for a second. Number one, devoted to the word. In a culture that says your truth is your truth today, right? Devoted to the word. In a culture in a time right now that is more connected than ever, but yet more disconnected than ever, information through the roof, research through the roof, resources through the roof, but intimacy lower than it's ever been, they were committed to community. In a culture right now that says you got to protect your own family and just watch out for you and your spouse, just watch out for you and your kids, these people were sacrificially giving to cover each other's back. It said that they gave so generously to one another and into the community that no one even had need. Imagine that. That the gospel didn't just impact them spiritually, it impacted them financially. In a culture right now that, that feels like they have to buy and make their way. You ever been in a situation where you feel like you kind of have to take it into your own hands and you got to prove to someone why you should get the job, why you should get married to that person, why that person should accept you? But the early church just walked in this grace, and we would call it biblically favor, that you don't have to bust down a door, but actually the Lord opens doors that no one can shut, and he shuts doors that no one can open. They walked in favor, number five, they shared their faith. In a culture right now that says you can never share anything about your faith, keep it to yourself, don't post about it on social media, they were not only sharing their faith with people that didn't like them, they were being physically persecuted for sharing their faith. So let's go back to that again. This wasn't a weekly service. This was their lifestyle. Can I say this? That I think 2024 moving forward, I think the Lord wants to see an Acts church rebirth in a special way. And I think people are hungry for it. I think people right now are really, really fed up with just going through church, <laughs> just being honest. And I don't want to sound bashful. Matter of fact, there's incredible churches all throughout Indianapolis. But I think the Lord wants to see a church that really wants to walk this out and really wants to do life together, and really wants to walk in everything that God has. 
Let's put this picture up on the screen. Um, you know that today is game seven, and you know I had to weave it into my sermon somehow. So if you don't know what's happening, it's okay if you don't care. Caution, all the anti-sports people out there, you don't have to like this. You don't have to like sports to go to this church, so let's just make that clear, okay? Okay. But I do happen to be really, really into what's happening in my role and as a fan. The Pacers are in Game 7, playing at 3.30 today in Madison Square Garden. Yes. And apparently last time they played Game 7 in Madison Square Garden, we won in 1995. Going all the way back, let's just put this picture up. <sighs> Man. Hey, can we just shout out our Pacers one time, though? And I, I know I'm biased, okay? But I love Indiana basketball. I just had someone ask me the other day, what is it about Indiana and basketball? Like, I don't get it. They're from California. They're asking me. I don't, I don't get it. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, everybody just has a basketball goal. Yeah, I love when I, I drive past, like, a barn out in the country, and they've just got a long driveway and a basketball hoop. Cornfields. It's like, anyone, like, when you travel back in and through the Indianapolis airport, you just take a deep breath. Oh, it's just home. <laughs> You go out, you see the, the cornfields. Man, we were just in Colorado, and I love the mountains, and I love the ocean, but there is nothing like Indiana. Can I get an amen? And I'm a little biased, but I love our state. So shout out to Reggie Miller, my all-time favorite player, and yes, there was a lot of controversy that came with that. But I'm thinking about today, okay, it's game seven. Pacers have not beat the Knicks on the road. They've only won, I think, one road game this entire playoffs, and yet we're one game away from the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't understand how all that happens. But in the basketball world, if you're not familiar with it, there's something that we would call home court advantage. When you're playing at home and you've got 18,000 fans at Gamebridge Fieldhouse all wearing a yellow T-shirt over their suit, over their jersey, isn't that just so fun to see people? I just love it. But here's the truth is when there's 18,000 fans screaming and they're all on your side, it's easy to win at home. It's hard to win on the road. We see that play out over and over in and through sports. And I was thinking about the pre-COVID church. Before COVID fully happened, 2020 coming in and, and how church was so changed, and how everything was different. And a lot of people, if you remember in the last few years, a lot of people really struggled in their faith in and through the last three to four years. In America, so many times, we only focus on the gathering, a weekly service. You with me? But in Acts, they were used to, somebody said the gathering, the gathering. and then the scattering. Whether it was through persecution, whether it was through a word of God that where they laid hands on people and they sent out Paul and they sent out Barnabas, they were used to the rhythm, the dance of gathering and scattering. And I felt like the Lord put this on my heart, is that the pre-COVID church, we had a lot of whiplash from what happened and we did not really thrive in many ways because we knew how to win at home, but we did not know how to win on the road. It's really easy on Sunday morning to win. We are all together. We're raising our hands. We're encouraging each other. We're praying for each other. We're giving each other high fives. But when we go back out of here and we go on the road, how many of y'all know it's a little bit more difficult to live in victory? It's a little bit more difficult to fight temptation. It's a little bit more difficult to keep our temper. It's a little bit more difficult to not lose it on our spouse and our kids. It's a little bit more difficult because it's harder to win on the road. Matter of fact, when I travel, when I go, whether it's guest speaking or a camp or I'm learning at a conference, it's really difficult to win spiritually when I am physically traveling. I've noticed that. Let's unpack this a little bit more. Number one, they were devoted to the word. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Look at this quote from Gallup 2022. It says this, a record low of 20% of Americans now say the Bible is the literal word of God, down from 24% the last time the question was asked in 2017, and half of what it was asked at its high points in 1980 and 1984. Meanwhile, a new high of 29% say the Bible is a collection of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. Let me just say this very clear and simple. 
so that you know who we are, what we believe, where we're going. Culture always changes, but the word will always remain the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We need a church right now that's unwavering, that's uncompromising. We believe in Timothy that the word of God was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It is active. It is alive. It is the authoritative word of God. As one of my friends Jackson has said before, this isn't shopping cart Christianity. (laughs) <laughs> where we get to walk through the aisle and say, oh, I like that chapter, and I like that verse. Throw that one in the cart, but I'm going to kind of leave these out of here. We believe in the Bible here. You all need to know that. The Bible is our compass. When you ask the question, how do I hear from God, the Word is the greatest first place to go to. And we believe, you know, I love this, love this thought when people say, I don't know, Andy. God, I don't know. I haven't heard God speak to me recently. I feel like he's been silent. You all know he's speaking in his word 24-7, 365, every single day. So don't say that the, the Lord has been silent if you haven't been in the word first, right? Culture is changing, but the word remains the same. I love that theologically when we unpack who Jesus is, God the Son, the Logos Word of God, that when we interact with these pages, this is not just a textbook that we pick off of a shelf, but we're actually interacting with the living, breathing God. The Word, says in John, says the Word became flesh. The Word of God, Christ himself, took on flesh for us. And I felt this in my heart, you know, as as I was preparing, planning, I always pray, Lord, If you want to give a prophetic word to the congregation, if you want to speak something through me that will be a direct word for now, not just 2,000 years ago, but today, this is another thing the Lord put on my heart. Be careful to not confuse the algorithm from the anointing. A lot of us right now, our spiritual diet hinges on our algorithm of Christian influencers. And we would put our, our, our bank and how much we're being filled and fed on the word by an Instagram reel that's five seconds long. We say, okay, I got my Devo for today. And the Lord is saying, no, no, I don't want you to just live on things that are regurgitated out of someone else's mouth. I want you to hear it directly from me. I want you to hear it from me, son to father, daughter to father, because nothing can replace the intimacy of what it means to live in the word, to read the word. To study the word. I love this picture of Aliana and I. My, my, my daughter, Aliana, I got to shout her out one time. This is just fun. Um, she began to chew gum for the first time yesterday, ever. That was an amazing sight. Just this, <laughs> Jackson's got his hands up. Yeah, bro, we did it. I'm sorry. But this is a picture of Aliana. Uh, she's now three years old. She loves dancing, singing. She's just, I love being a girl dad. And when people say, you're, you're just such a girl, Dad, I don't know to take that as a compliment or an insult, but I guess I'll take it as a compliment, right? So believe in for a boy one day, shout out, okay. But no, that is no announcement. If anyone's that, nope, no announcement, there is none. But there was a moment over time as a father to daughter where I feed her and she doesn't know how to feed herself, Okay. And there comes a point where she takes, what is that, a spork? You know, the Taco Bell sporks? Is that where they came from, right? The baby sporks. It's a spoon and a fork. My my wife says, Andy, can you grab me a spoon? I grab both. It's just like, check it out. I got both. Whatever you want, mama, okay? But there comes a point in our spiritual life where we don't rely on someone else to feed us the word. And I don't want to be bashful, okay? And I don't want to be critical. I don't, want to, I don't want to come across offensive in any way. But some of us are living depending on just me, depending on the algorithm, depending on the YouTube message to get your feeding from the word of God. Now, we come here and we gather. I am your pastor. I am your shepherd. It is a responsibility for me to equip the saints for works of service. So every single week, unless we have a guest speaker, unless I'm on vacation, I will do my best to prepare something that's spirit-led, that I've prayed through, I've thought through, I've given to the Lord to prepare for you, for sure. Amen. Amen. But there comes a moment where you say, 
I'm going to start to learn how I can feed myself the word. I think this is really important. When we think about scripture, reading scripture, I think there's three things that we can quickly take from it. There's a million things that we could take from it. But scripture, let's start with the word intimacy. When we open up the word, we're not just flipping pages, taking cool advice and thoughts. But like I said, we're, we're interacting with, with the Lord. And intimacy, everything in your walk, if you wanted to, to pin down one word, if you're saying, Andy, how do I walk and thrive in life? I'd boil it down to one word, intimacy. Because if, you're, if your walk with the Lord is just based on information, but not revelation, eventually it will become a chore. What is revelation? It's when you're spending time in the word. It's when you're spending time in God's presence and you realize that the word is alive, that the Lord is with you, and a, a phrase pops off the page, a verse pops off the page, and the Lord opens your eyes to be able to see something that's always been there. But now you're seeing it with fresh eyes. Romans 12 would call this being transformed by what? The renewing of our minds. To go deeper in scripture, every single day I've got to renew my mind. And as I learn, as I study, as I open up the word and I go to commentaries that are trustworthy, Blue Letter Bible is one of them. Look up Blue Letter Bible. If you're like, Andy, I want to grow in scripture. Blue Letter Bible, there's tons of trustworthy commentaries on there. Unpack it from people who have studied this for decades and ask questions. I didn't take a class specifically at Indiana Westland on Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, but there's different teachings that I was under where you can understand and begin to slowly unpack the original languages that the word was written in. Studying the word and three guidance. And let me put this up on the screen. This is really important. As we look at the context of Acts, what people don't understand when we read the Bible and people's encounters over and over as a community, they read scripture as a community. But they would refer to the Torah. They would refer to the, the, the teachings of the apostles that they devoted themselves to. That oftentimes the letters would be read aloud to a community. That they're hearing the word together. They're not just on their phone late at night looking through an algorithm, looking for something that's inspirational. Are you with me? So it's super important as a church. Y'all. I'm not a doom and gloom preacher, but the more the church is pressed and squeezed and put under certain things, and even this country, we have to know how to learn the word together, to read the word together, to study it together. This is what happens overseas all the time, all the time in China, all the time in persecuted places in Africa. They are reading scripture together because we know we all have blind spots we're in a, a series right now, we, we're calling it No Cap. Leaders need to know where their blind spots are at. Leaders know where I'm strong and where I'm weak. And they find people as the Holy Spirit leads them to say, man, I know that you balance me in that area. Like, I don't fully understand this. Shout out to Jackson Free, man. Like, like there's so many differences in who we are in Christ, but man, we challenge each other. And I come from a, a, a tradition that may be more spirit-led, spiritual gifts. And Jackson has challenged me in the word. Man, some of our best conversations have come from reading a passage together. Are you with me? It's super important and it's super practical. Number two, they were committed to community. Acts 2, 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. In 2024, you just need to know this, there's an epidemic of a lack of intimacy. Everything is wide. Casting a wide net is not bad. Having a lot of friends is not bad. Networking with a lot of people is not bad. But if it comes at the cost of real intimacy with real friendships and real places where people actually know who you are, not just the Instagram, Facebook version of who they see you are, but they know your temptations. They know how to pray for you. One of the easiest next steps, if, if you're saying, Andy, oh my gosh, this is hitting my heart today, go on our website and just look at the circles that we have to offer. We have a men's group that meets here Tuesday nights. We have a, men, a women's group that meets once a month in the kids' wing. We have other co-ed circles. Like, that's an easy next step to just say, okay, maybe I need, I need to just join a circle today. 
But you need to know this. A phrase that's often been shared is this. A church is not a building to go to. It's a family to belong to. And this is the good news about the church of Acts is that it didn't matter where they met. If we're in this building or at the YMCA, one church is not this building. Are you with me? When I come to one church, you know what my favorite part about one church is? The people. It's not the building. I love this place. I love how we renovated it. I love how we we spice it up a little bit. And it looks like it's contextualized for our audience in Westfield. But it does not matter where we meet. It did not matter where they met because the church is not a building. It's a people. Okay? So Acts 4.32, all the believers were one in mind, one in heart. Did that mean they were all alike, all dressed alike, all had the same haircut? That would be called a cult. No. Okay? But this was a group of people, watch this, that bought into something that was just bigger than themselves. This isn't just about my individual legacy and my individual accolades and my mission and my vision, but they bought into something that was bigger than them, and that was the kingdom of God on the move, one in heart, one of mine, and they shared their possessions that no one claimed any of their possessions was even their own. That's convicting just reading it out loud. So here's the question. Why do we often just refer to churches in the West as an individual church name? Now, I get it. We're we're our own community, one church. But one of the reasons why we named ourselves one, there's a variety of reasons, but notice this. In the New Testament, Paul writes these letters all the time. He says this, to the church of Thessalonica, to the church of Galatia, to the churches in Philippi, to the church. What is he doing? He's not referring to just a single gathering. He's referring to a church of a region. What if we began to see the churches of Indianapolis as the church of Indianapolis? I think the more I get into ministry, I realize that there is a deeper layer of hidden jealousy and competition between churches all throughout this region. And it's really sick and twisted, and it's really weird because it's like we're all wearing the same jersey, but we don't want to pass the ball to each other. You don't win games like that. And if we're going to cast a wide net, we can't be the only ones holding on to the net. When we go into the YMCA and into Grand Park, I'm already grateful and thankful that there's plenty of other churches who have already been planting and watering in and around that area. Because this is not about one church. It's about the capital C, church. I love this quote from our district superintendent, the Westland Church. He says this, it takes all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. And we celebrate that. One church is going to be different than the next church. And I love Northview. I love Trader's Point. Man, I was baptized at Life Church. I was dedicated as a baby at Northview. I have family that works at Trader's Point. When we invite people to One Step, one of the first things I always tell them is, guess what? We did not get into this thing called One Church to compete with other churches. We got into this to win the lost. So we rebuke a spirit of competition that's dividing all of us And we look like the ones who are fools, right? This is really important. I know a lot of people, you grew up in different denominations, backgrounds, and you might be used to a certain style of worship, different types of preaching and teaching. You just need to know this truth, that the word and the spirit cannot be divorced. The word confirms the spirit, and the spirit confirms the word. So I'm going a little deeper with you, but I want to help you understand that no matter what church you're at, if they're living on biblical values, if they're clear about the mission, vision, values, I never want to convince someone to come to one church. I want them to feel called here. I don't believe that church today needs to be a sales pitch. Yes, we're going to do our very best to be excellent, family-oriented, and have things ready and set up for you. But let me ask you a question, all right? If you saw me fishing in an aquarium, what would you think of me? He said, easy. What'd you think? And you see me on the side of the road. I've just got this giant aquarium and I am fishing in this aquarium. People would think I'm out of my mind. What if that's what churches look like today? Where we're casting a net into things that have already been caught and our lines are tangled up 
and we're arguing about who has the coolest fishing pole, who has the coolest fishing net, who has the coolest this, while there is an ocean of people that the Lord is saying the harvest is ripe. There are so many people who are hungry and thirsty and waiting. So let's stop fishing in an aquarium. Let's cast it into the ocean. They were devoted to the word. They were committed to community. Acts 4.32 says this, all the believers were one in heart, one in mind. No one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. I told you, I'm not a doom and gloom preacher. I'm not, uh, if you get to know me, I'm actually really optimistic. I actually have a lot of faith for things, and I know sometimes when I preach, I get pretty intense. I, I, sometimes I think, man, if they just saw my sermon, but they haven't met me in person, they might think I'm a lot more intense than I am off the stage. <laughs> But here's the thing is I have to preach with my whole heart, my whole body, my whole mind. That's just the only way I know how to do it. But it said they were one in heart, one in mind. You need to know this again. Unity is not uniformity. So the players on the team, they all don't have the same gifts. They all don't have the same strengths, the same weaknesses. This picture, let's put up on the screen for a second. Um, yes. Take a deep breath again. And if you don't know this moment, back into the 90s, Reggie Miller and Spike Lee. And then this picture happened, which I'm not sure what to do with this picture. Um, not sure if I would subscribe to doing that either. But here's what John 17, 20 through 21 says. My prayer is not for them alone, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them will believe, that all of them will be one. Father, as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. When a team goes on the road and they're playing a road game and they know there are going to be people yelling at them, there's going to be people saying all sorts of things to them, and there's going to be a lot of pushback, right? What does a team do? They say, as long as we can make sure that the locker room is on the same page, it doesn't matter what they're saying out there. We know what's true in here. Are you with me this morning? And here's the beautiful thing, is that when we live in unity and we, we lay down offenses, we lay down pride, and we lay down things that are our preferences for what we like, but not what the Lord calls us to love about what it means to be in the body of Christ, what ends up happening, John, the gospel of John says this, that when we are one, somebody say one, one. then the world will know and may believe that you have sent me. That means when Christians realize they're, they're wearing the same jersey, the world notices that. When Christians are selfless towards one another, they're forgiving towards one another. I think this is why the enemy attacks the body of Christ so much because he knows that if we live in a unity that's different than the rest of the world who's divided, offended, fed up with each other, if we can buy into something bigger than ourselves, the world's going to take notice of that and say, wow, that community's different than my workplace. That community is different than the home that I grew up in. So here's number three, they gave generously. Love this quote from John Wesley. Look at this, he says this, oftentimes the last part of a man to be converted is his wallet. Let me just take a pause on that one for a second, right? Acts 2.45 says this, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I want you to know this practically, this isn't, just a sermon I'm preaching, but, but we want to live this. We have been living this out that if, if there's a serious financial need, even in the house today, with us online, please reach out. I think that's one of the most joy-filled moments as a pastor when someone is in need and we get to say, hey, you're not alone. We see you. We want to help cover that need, whatever that may be for you. Obviously, within reason, within the budget, within what the Lord, more, most importantly, is calling us to do. But you need to know this about generosity. Evangelism shares the gospel. Generosity shows the gospel. So to a world who is so stingy, right, so many times, and I got to protect just my own. I got to just protect my family, my flock, my tribe. When we step out at the dinner table at a restaurant and we tip over 20%, even when they didn't deserve it, 
I know, Andy, I don't know about that. Over 20%? I don't. Yes. How many times Leanne's and I have been in moments where we could talk and we could preach the gospel to them, but when we bless them, when they did not deserve it, by his kindness he leads us to repentance. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ still died for us. When you step out in generosity, it shows the gospel. And can I just say this? I think it even takes down a wall that a lot of non-believers have about Christians. Because they're used to our lip service. They're used to our scriptures and our memory verses that we want to give them. And all that's great. And the Lord might give you a word for someone that is scripture-based right in the moment. Yes and amen. But a lot of times when we show them, we don't shout at them. All of a sudden, they're interested. Because they see that actions speak louder than words. It says this, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, there was no needy persons among them from time to time. Those who owned land or houses even sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Here's number four. As they walked in generosity, they also walked in favor. Acts 2.47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Enjoying the favor. And I know we live in a culture right now, especially with the election coming up in six months or so, where people are afraid. People are a little worried. People, I hear people all the time saying, I don't know what's going to happen to the economy. I don't know what's going to happen. And you just need to know this so clearly as a believer following Jesus, God's people can prosper in the midst of economic collapse. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread, but in the middle of chaos, in the middle of collapse, the good news is we operate under an economy that the world does not know about, and that's the economy of the kingdom of God, that we thrive, we don't just survive, we don't just get out of it barely, but we are blessed abundantly. And we give generously. Isaiah 22, 22 says this, I will place on his shoulder a key to the house of David. In the Old Testament, the, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. When you understand the kingdom principle, the revelation hits that you don't have to walk in striving, you walk in favor. One of the chaplains that I hung out with during All-Star Weekend about a year or two ago, one of the things that he would always tell me, and I love this phrase, he said, Andy, everywhere we go, we walk in favor. We don't have to try to find a key to get into a hidden door. We don't have to prove ourselves to someone to make us feel like, oh, look at them, look at what they do. We don't have to tell people about our accomplishments. In the first 10 seconds of our conversation, we can be listeners and remember that it's not about us, it's actually about them, and we also walk in favor. So that the Lord opens doors that no man can shut, and he shuts no doors that no man can open. Have you ever had a moment like this? I know I've seen it in and through one church so many times where you realize, man, I didn't even have to do anything to prove to someone, but it's actually our obedience behind closed doors because when the Lord sees you faithful in private, he will oftentimes bless you in public because the Lord isn't concerned about what we can try to prove to people and show to people. He's actually really interested in your character behind closed doors. When the blessing did not come, when the relationship did not come, when the finances were not there, and the Lord wants to still see if we're faithful because he knows he can only entrust so much favor until we get fattened off the favor. So we only want God for what he can do for us and we start to worship God for the open door not for the open tomb. Let me ask that question again. Is our walk with the Lord right now more based on the open door or the open tomb? That'll be a devotion for you and the Lord and myself later this week. But here's what you need to know about what's happening in the kingdom of God and through Acts. Miracles confirm the power of the gospel. So, so many times, when someone gets healed, when there's a financial breakthrough. I love the phrase from one of the, the great church fathers that said, when we don't share our testimony, in many ways we are robbing God of his glory. So that when we walk in the miraculous and when we walk in favor, yes, pray about it. Some things the Lord does in my life and the Lord says, Andy, don't share that with the church. It's not time. 
or it's not the right season, or maybe never. That was just for you and your family to see how amazing I am, to take care of you guys, to take care of your girls. But when we step out in faith, here's the thing about miracles. We can't say God doesn't do the miraculous if we don't step out in faith. Oh God, I don't know if you still heal. I don't know if you still speak in that same way. But the Lord is saying, no, no, no. But to see the miracle, the Lord is asking us to cooperate in faith so that we hold his hand and he says, step, and we step. And he says, go left, we go left. And when he says, go right, we go right. And over time, you start to see the miraculous still happening. We believe God still heals today. Many people on Pentecost Sunday would say, that stuff was just for the apostles. That was just for them. Some people would even go to the point of saying in a belief of cessationism that the Holy Spirit and the gifts are not even fully active in the way that they were. We would say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And can I tell you one church? Can I tell you this? I see a church that's hungry. I see a church that's thirsty. I, I see a church that is saying, Andy, I want to see more. The Lord gave me an acronym for more the other day. He, he, he explained it to me this way. Walking in the miraculous, seeing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, praying for revival, and eager for more. Are you ready for more? Amen. The Lord, I think, in many ways, even today on Pentecost Sunday, is saying the Holy Spirit is the one who distributes the gifts. So we don't all have the same gifts, but maybe today, even during worship, during the response, you might even be saying, Lord, is there a gift that you want to activate in me that I have not been walking in? Is there a gift that you have activated in my life that I've forsaken, that I've stepped away from? I think so many times, even in this house today, online, people have callings, and anointings from the Lord, but the fear of man has choked it out. And what other people might think about you, you know how many times I battle that? Every single week, going up into this point, getting on stage, and the Lord has to remind me, no, 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 Andy, this is an anointing on your life. This isn't just talent. This is a calling on your life. Look at what it says. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, verse 43. So what are the gifts on this Pentecost Sunday that the Lord might even want to stir up in you? As Paul told Timothy, fan the flame, stir it up in you with the laying on of hands. Even after service, we'll have a prayer team up front. I'd love for you to be able to come and be prayed for. Here's number five, and we'll be done. They shared their faith. Can we just say amen to that? Hallelujah. That they did not get choked out by the fear of man with the Reggie Miller choking sign. But they said, no, 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 we're going to move on and share our faith no matter the cost. Look at this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says this, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Because so many times, y'all, non-believers, they're not reading their Bible. They're reading you. And they're looking at your life. And they're saying, man, if they look just like the world does, can I, can I go to this point? Our attitudes, we walk into work. If we have the same pessimistic, oh, everything's terrible, everything's hard, everything's the worst, I don't know why. I don't know if, if the world really sees that as attractive at all when we're not meant to go from bummer to bummer, but we're meant to go from glory to glory. And I'm not saying that you have to fake it, okay? Because someone's going to take that and they're going to snip it and say, look, Andy thinks everything should just be great. No, no, no. We prosper as we suffer. We're blessed as we're persecuted. We rejoice even in the midst of all troubles, knowing that these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. Do we actually believe that God already won this thing, or do we believe it's just a game seven? And we don't know who's going to win. My Bible says in Revelation, we already won. I don't even have to watch game seven. I already know. Acts 2.47 praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You need to know this. Their community was not a holy huddle. So, so many times in church when we talk about community, small groups, it becomes about me, myself, and I, my accountability group, how we can improve, how we can become better Christians. Y'all, we believe heaven and hell are really on the line, that people are actually going to hell. If you don't believe that's true, 
it may not stir up in you what they knew in the early church, that eternity is really on the line. If we actually believe that, then we might not see the gospel as a behavior modification message. We would see it as a rescue mission. And I'm not a doom and gloom preacher. I don't want you to walk around saying those big signs outside the Pacers game. Everyone here, you might be going to hell. Many times, yes, God can still work through that. Yes, people do get saved through that. But what you win people with, you keep them with. So let's not win people by a fear-based gospel still, okay? Because we know that at the end of the day, the greatest of these things is faith, hope, and love. That everything we should do in our witness, everything that we should do at the restaurant, at our, with our coworkers, with our sports teams, it all should come from a place of love. Paul even says, hey, if you make the loudest noises and you, you think you're the coolest thing ever, you might be a, a sound of a clanging gong if you don't have love. But love trumps all those things. So it says this Gospel Coalition quote, I love this. So we share our dinner tables together. We wait at the school gates together. We serve our community together. We become regulars at the local coffee shop together. We have barbecues together. We watch sports together. We exercise together. Shout out to the YMCA. We're about to have a brand new space. Come on. And we live our lives together so that our unbelieving friends might not just meet one Christian, but they might meet the church. It's this concept that's called group evangelism. This is the early church. When I say the word evangelism, oftentimes you think of me in the middle of Castleton Mall handing out things and asking one person at a time a question. But this was a lifestyle, a kingdom culture that they were living that was so attractive, they were so unified, they were so grounded in the word, they were so led in the spirit and the favor that people on the outside were just saying, I want to be a part of that. Like, I don't see that today. That's the kingdom of God. And it's beautiful. So can I give you this phrase for our church? This is what we are. We're family on mission. Shout out to Caleb Stout, who gave me that quote. We're family on mission. Can we praise the Lord for that? We need a place where, where we know each other's name. We know what's going on in our family's lives, but we are on mission. So would you stand to your feet with me as we close? Acts 4, 8 through 12 says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, he's probably talking a lot louder than that, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called today for an account of kindness shown to a man who was lame, a miracle had happened, and are being healed, and asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ, praise God, of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. And this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, but only one name under heaven in which we must be saved. Context of this passage, if you just read it, it's like, okay, Peter is, is, is just going crazy now. But you got to know, this is the same guy that denied Jesus three times. This is the same guy that when they went to him and said, hey, are you team Jesus or not? He said, I don't know about that jersey. I'm not wearing that jersey. I don't know even who you're really talking about. But then post-Pentecost Peter says salvation is found in no one else. But what does it say at the very beginning? Verse eight, it says he's what? He's filled with the Spirit. So trying to witness to people without the power of the Holy Spirit is like trying to drive a car with no gas in it. And we say, get in the car. <laughs> like, what is this, a hostage takeover? You're trying to just convince me to follow Jesus? But when we're living, come on, when we're operating, when we're flowing, in step with the Holy Spirit. Watch this. We go from a coward that denies Jesus to courageously being a rock, a pillar to witness and to testify. This is why our time in the word is so important, you all, because first to see the, the one horizontally, we have to first see the one vertically. But we can't be for the one without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't witness to people without the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, it may be able to give them a formula and a frame of doctrine, but we don't want formula with no fruit. 
we don't want formula with any flavor, without any flavor. So here's what you need to know. The Holy Spirit is in you for you. Watch this. The Holy Spirit is on you for others. So the Holy Spirit, when you believe in Christ, it says it is deposited into your heart that no one can confess that Jesus is Lord without the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is in us. He's a comforter. He's a counselor. He's a convictor. He's the one that convicts us when we do something that was a little shady and you feel that little voice in your heart that says, go and apologize to that person. That's called conviction. When we're not saved, we live under condemnation. But it says in Romans 8, 1, for those who are saved, who are in Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation. That's good news. Because of the blood of Jesus, because of the torn curtain, because of him paying the price that we deserved. But then the Holy Spirit is honest, brothers. I want to show this picture of me and my buddy Brandon. And this was a funny moment for me. Um, May of 2022, I got invited to my first ever NHL playoff hockey game. Can I tell all the parents, don't bring your kids to a hockey game, okay? Pacers game might be safe. Hockey game when you're wearing the opposite team's jersey at their stadium. I got a lot of things signed at me. I don't know what they meant, you know what I mean? But okay. Got a lot of things said to me. Here's another picture. We were sitting down low. It was fun. Brandon Shoup, church planter out of Colorado Springs. Shout out to my brother. Been a mentor and a friend for the past couple years. But here's the question that I think this text posed in so many ways as we live in this world. Because we know Jesus has not returned. Because Jesus has not returned yet, that must mean we have a mission that's still at play. We're not here to coexist. We're not here to float, float around. We're not here to just be nice to people. We are here for a gospel rescue mission in our classrooms, at our workplace, on our teams, in our neighborhoods. But here's the question that I felt God was asking me. And I felt like God posed this question to me first. Andy, would you go into a stadium of people wearing Team Jesus? if you are just one of 12 or 120 in a stadium of 14,000. That experience was a little different than home court advantage. It's a little different when you're in a stadium, when everyone's wearing the same jersey and we're all on the same team. And here, and this is what Paul tells Timothy, he says this, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Well, can we have a, a movement rise up in and through this church and in through Hamilton County of people who are not ashamed of the power of the gospel? Because we know that Romans 1.16 says that it is the power of God that brings salvation first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. I'm not unashamed. I'm not ashamed of the faith that I have. So here's where I want to end. What does the post-COVID church look like then? 1990s, Pacers versus Knicks. 2024, Pacers versus Knicks. Now, can I tell you this? The Knicks are not the enemy, okay? So if you're all thinking, how is Andy setting this up? I actually had a conversation over Zoom. Shout out to the Knicks chaplain. He's a really nice guy, okay? This is much bigger than basketball. But if they tried to copy the same game plan in the 1990s and paste it in the 2020s for their game plan, it would not work. Why is that? We cannot try to copy the church of the past, you all. Can I say this? This is a new era. And where there is a new era, there is no lid for what God wants to do in and through our lives. But this is a new era the way that church is done, the way that we're operating in and through to be witnesses. This is a new era. We can't just look at the old game plan and say, okay, I think this will kind of work. Of course, there's principles in the Bible that will withstand all the tests of time, okay? But this is a new era. And you know what? When we were in Colorado, this is so fun. We actually visited a church out there. We ran into a couple. Jackson and Erica were out there with us. We ran into a couple that actually planted a church in Colorado, very similar size to us. We went and visited on Sunday morning when we were on vacation. And one of the pastors who was there visiting them, he was a missionary that they were supporting him. He said this, 
at the end of the game, let it be maybe for our context, a game seven, and if there's a blowout, which we're going to hope the Pacers do, yes, but hey, it's all good, bigger than basketball. But at the end of a, a game, what happens when it's a blowout, when the other team is winning by so much, when that specific team who's winning by so much, what do they do? They put their bench in. Does the coach need the bench to go in? No. Does the Lord need us to accomplish his mission in and through this earth? No. But the Lord loves each and every one of you so much. He says this, guess what? I already won the game. And it wasn't just a game seven where I barely won. It was actually by a landslide where death, hell, and the grave were defeated by the cross of Jesus Christ, by the gospel that Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected. He sends us his spirit. He says, good news, my children. I already won the game. And it wasn't even close, but I love you so much that I don't want to see you accept Jesus and sit on the bench and watch as we celebrate. But I want you to get in the game. And for some of us right now, you've been sitting on the bench way too long. And the Lord is saying, it's time to get in the game. There's a calling, there's a destiny, there is something on your life that has not been yet fulfilled yet. If your heart is still beating, can we praise the Lord? We still have a race to run. There's still people to reach. And can I testify? It's a new era. We don't have to f dwell on the things of the past, but I believe this. God has greater things for our church, even greater things for this city, even greater things for the kingdom of God. Amen? So let's praise the Lord one more time in this house. Come on, he's good. He's worthy. Come on. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. And on this Pentecost Sunday, I want to give a very clear response right now to whoever is saying, I am getting in the game, whether you've been on the bench for a breather or you have been on the bench for years. And you're saying today in Jesus name, I'm choosing to get off of the sidelines and I'm getting into the mission that God has in and through this city. Just raise a hand right now. I'm right there with you. This is just between you and the Lord. Let's lift our hands to the Lord if that's you. And Father, I pray on this Pentecost Sunday, would you pour out your spirit like never before on our church? Would you pour out your spirit, like it says in Acts 1-8, that we would be witnesses in Westfield, in Hamilton County, in Indiana, and to the ends of the earth, Lord. May there be a spirit of the boldness of the Lion of Judah. May there be a winsome, Yes, Lord, send me, amen. Attitude and feeling now, Lord. Lord, we want more. We want more of what you have for us. And I pray you would continue to advance the kingdom of God in and through our lives. It's in Jesus' name, all God's people said amen and amen. As we close, let's testify to this resurrection power. Let's testify to where the Lord's taking us. Come on, let's praise the Lord.